We've had a lot of birds with, with lead this year. We've already had 16 eagles come through the center, which is more than average, I would say. We had four that came to us strictly with lead poisoning. They were in very rough condition. Two of them actually had pellets in their stomach. We could see those on the x-ray. The other two had clenched talons, so they couldn't open their feet, they couldn't walk. Emaciated and in really rough shape. We may not be seeing this major bird apocalypse, but we do know that we're having birds succumb to lead poisoning. The question then becomes, well, how many birds have to die before it's enough to make somebody stand up and say we need to do something? And if that number gets too high, somebody else might say from the outside looking in, well, that's enough. And then you start to see this regulation. And I think hunters have that opportunity to say, if I'm having a negative impact in any way, then I wanna see what I can do to rectify that. My name is Becky Keene. I'm the Rehabilitation Director at the Montana Raptor Conservation Center. Here at the center, we get injured birds throughout the whole state and try to get them here to Bozeman and fix their injuries and, um, and in hopes for a healthy release back out into the wild. Uh, we also have ambassador birds that we use that cannot be released back into the wild. And we use those for educational purposes and teaching people the importance of these guys in our ecosystem. The main reason I work here at the Raptor Center is when I was a volunteer, it was kind of the highlight of my week. Um, we have a passion for these guys when they come in and see the state that they come in at, and to watch them go through that rehabilitation process is pretty amazing. Um, their will to survive is, is wonderful. Uh, they can come through some um, pretty amazing things. We do test um, every eagle that's been admitted into the center just to get an idea of what levels of lead that they do have in their system and majority of them have trace elements of lead in their system. I would say around 60% are elevated. Most of it that we see does correlate around hunting season. A lot of the evidence has pointed to these birds scavenging on a harvested animal that may be shot and not found or the gut pile was not buried and then they will come and scavenge off it. What the lead does is once it gets in the bloodstream it robs the body of calcium and iron. Um, it tricks the body into thinking it's getting those two essential nutrients. When they die of lead it's usually from starvation, dehydration. The lead is just completely has prevented them from eating and drinking and will we'll kill them. Bring a bird in with severe lead poisoning, the first steps are just to get them hydrated and try to get them stabilized. The chelation process will start immediately after we get them stabilized or even halfway stabilized. And that's a twice a day uh, injection of calcium EDTA. Um, that's also followed by lots of uh, subcutaneous fluids. It can work pretty good on getting that lead out of their system. The other birds that we had that didn't make it, you know, it's they get to a point where you think they're doing good and uh, everything seems positive and then all of a sudden they just go downhill really quick. A lot of my research tells the studying of lead poisoning and raptors and how those raptors come to be poisoned and ultimately it's from bullet fragments. So much of the research I do is related to the ballistics of lead and non-lead ammo. One of the best ways to show bullet performance and the fragmentation of lead is to shoot into water. And what they do is they take a rain barrel, put it on its side, and then inside the rain barrel, you put in water jugs. You shoot into those, the bullets will expand and fragment if it's lead, and the particles from the bullet will settle down onto the bottom of the rain barrel and spray out all those little fragments. And people are always astounded when they see the hundreds of fragments left over by a lead bullet. We've also studied scavengers in general to really establish that pathway of how they can consume lead. So for instance, ground squirrels and prairie dogs. In the western United States, it's estimated that millions of prairie dogs are shot. And that's a lot of food that can be left over for scavengers. And one study we carried out was putting game cameras near those types of carcasses to basically just photograph which scavengers might be consuming that lead. Anything with fangs or talons showed up to scavenge from badgers to burrowing owls. We saw 
golden eagles, a lot of corvids, so ravens, magpies, and an assortment of different hawks too, so Swainson's hawks and harriers, red-tailed hawks. If I leave behind an elk carcass or a gut pile, 45 scavengers could show up and feast on those remains. I see it as a beneficial thing to the ecosystem, but if there's lead left over in any of that, then those animals can be carrying that with them. For me, just shooting a lead-free bullet makes sense because I'm, I think, benefiting a lot of these animals. But also, hunters in general really care about wildlife, and not just the wildlife that might end up on a dinner plate. Hunters like seeing all the different dynamics that can happen when they're in the field. Shooting lead-free, it's just another way that we can help promote the ecosystem. Hunters are the ultimate conservationists. As a hunter, I am not, I'm not keen on legislation against lead for hunting. I'd rather see people make a decision to use a bullet like ours because they prefer it over what they were using before. I'm Steve Davis with Hammer Bullets, and we make pure copper CNC lathe turned bullets. In our quest for the better hunting bullet that wouldn't create so much meat damage, we found copper bullets and tried lots of those and everything we tried had some sort of an issue and in the end um, we wound up making it. You know we did we did our gel test yesterday and we saw our bullet compared to a very premium lead core hunting bullet and saw that our bullet did every bit as good, if not better, but there is no lead fragmentation because it doesn't exist in our bullet. You could see that lead fragmentation that was left behind all the way through. There was that darkness, you know, and those pieces are so small, I, don't, I just don't think they're really detectable when you start trimming. You know, it, it's there. I don't know the release rate on severe lead birds. I know it's not super good. We were able to release a bird this year that had severe lead poisoning and get him back out there, so that was awesome. We talked to so many people who have no idea what lead does and what putting lead in the environment can do to any scavenging animal. You know, we have seen a lot of people make changes based off what we're putting out there. I've spoke to numerous people who have switched to non-lead ammunition because of what they've heard us say. If your stuff that you were using before is out of stock, maybe this is a great time to think about switching over to non-lead. It's such a little ask for such an incredible gain. I have a lot of respect for these raptors and what they have to do out there just to survive. They have a pretty tough life out there. I just have a huge respect for what they do and um, how they can overcome all those obstacles. We face a lot of environmental issues, and as individuals, it can be difficult to know how we can deal with those issues. But with lead poisoning and wildlife, all we have to do is chamber non-lead ammunition.